Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about power supplies and look at the main contributors to the output side noise. Now any circuit will generate more or less noise, but there are measures that can be taken to improve things or make them worse. As with any complex circuit, a power supply can have multiple reasons to be noisy. And these reasons need to be taken into consideration if the output noise is a design concern. So, if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. Depending on the power supply type, the output noise can be anywhere from even a few volts peak to peak down to the nanovolt region. The range in which noise will be found will depend on the power supply type, its construction, but also the surrounding circuitry. This is a complex problem, since there are multiple mechanisms by which noise can end up on the power supply's output. Part of the noise will be generated inside of the circuit, and part of it will come from the outside. To analyze the basic noise mechanisms, let's start off by looking at the power supply block diagram. So the power supply type, known to be the most noisy, is the switching converter. Here, noise is mainly generated in the power stage. Because of the switching action of the converter, the output will not be a clean DC value, but rather there will be some amount of ripple because of the chunky way in which energy is transferred through the circuit. This energy transfer is usually occurring at high frequency, so the switching frequency, but noise is also observed at higher multiples. And then you will also have various ringing associated noises. Another noise source which is independent of power supply type is noise coming from the input side. The input of the supply is not always perfectly clean. There will be some noise here. And part of it will pass through the supply. In this category, you can also include noisy environments. So if the supply is placed close to other noise sources, these can couple into the supply and generate variations on the output. And finally, even if you have a nice linear regulator with a very stable input source and no external perturbations, there will still be noise on the output coming from the elements in the feedback network. So mainly the voltage reference, the error amplifier, and the feedback resistors. There is no such thing as a perfectly clean electronic power supply. Let's start with the most obvious noise source, the switching that is occurring in a switching converter. Now, although it is generally accepted that a switching converter is more noisy than a linear converter, not all switching converters are the same. You have bad, and then you have worse. From a control point of view, when it comes to low power switching supplies, the hysteretic converter is used. This is a pulse frequency modulated circuit that relies on a hysteresis in the output to drive the power stage. So here, the error amplifier isn't really an amplifier, but rather a comparator with a hysteresis. So other than the high frequency switching noise, the output also needs to oscillate sufficiently to go between the thresholds of the error amplifier. Next, a factor that impacts the output noise is the specific way in which the power stage is built. In particular, how does it transfer energy towards the output? And here we have two distinct cases, of which the most basic representatives are the buck and the boost converter. So when the switches are on the output side, like with the boost converter, energy is transferred to the output in chunks with pauses. You are getting ripple from the large current variation, but also you get substantial high frequency noise from the sharp transitions. In contrast, when an inductor is on the output, like with the buck converter, energy is continuously being transferred to the output in a far less abrupt fashion. So a buck converter output is usually less noisy than the boost converter output. Last thing to mention is the conduction mechanism. Just because you have a buck, does not mean it will be less noisy. It also depends on whether you can keep it continuously delivering current. So keep it in the continuous conduction mode. Once you put it into discontinuous conduction mode, where the inductor current goes through zero, the output will end up having more noise, because again, you end up delivering energy in chunks. Normally, measuring switching related noise is not that difficult. The noise is so large in amplitude, you shouldn't have any problem being able to measure it using a standard oscilloscope. So just to highlight this, I prepared a setup with a boost converter 
connected to a static load and supplied from a power supply. And then the output is connected to the oscilloscope using a low noise connection. So if we turn on the power supply, we can see very nicely the switching related noise. So the frequency of this thing is about 1.6 megahertz, which is the switching frequency of our power supply. And while it has a characteristic waveform. Now, depending on your measurement goal, you can perform this measurement using a 20 megahertz bandwidth limit, which will mostly filter out all of the high frequency noise. But if you disable this limit, then you're much better see various spikes appearing, which are the high frequency noise content of the output. Now, depending on what your measurement goal is, you may or may not want to see this. So if you just want to see the waveform of the supply that will end up at your load, you can keep the bandwidth limitation on. But if you're interested in the overall noise output, so something that you might see during your emission tests, then you want to keep the no bandwidth limitation. So this sort of spikes will usually cause problems that will be visible in your emission tests. Now, when performing output noise measurements, it's very important to take care that you are performing a low noise measurement. So to use short twisted cables, a spring on the oscilloscope probe, so very small measurement loops. And the reason for this being that if you don't use this, then you'll end up with completely different measurement results. So if I take my other probe and just leave the alligator clip on, and well, we try to measure the exact same thing. So right now both probes are at 20 millivolts per division, and we can see there's way more noise on the yellow channel than on the blue channel. So when we have 50 millivolts per division on the yellow channel, we can get a more clear picture, so we have the same basic waveform shape, but the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude is almost double. So in general, there's quite a lot of noise around a switching converter, and if you're using huge loops, then you'll be picking up that noise as well, which is not necessarily the noise that is present on the output. So when trying to measure output noise, it's important to take care that you only measure output noise. When it comes to noise coming from the input side, the measure by which a supply will be able to filter it out is characterized by its power supply rejection ratio. This is a parameter that describes the attenuation the supply will present at different frequencies to noise present on the input side. So it's a non-constant frequency dependent value. Most often, there will be some information regarding this in the datasheet, but if it's needed, the method by which it can be measured involves injecting noise on the input of the supply and sweeping the signal frequency. Both the input and output of the supply need to be measured, and then the amplitude of the specific noise frequency can be compared and plotted out in a nice graph. So, to highlight the test on power supply rejection ratio, I prepared the setup right here. So, what I have here is my signal generator, whose output is going into the power amplifier, and then this is supplying the test circuit, which for today's purposes is the LM323 linear regulator, and then the oscilloscope is measuring the input and the output of the test circuit. Now, the oscilloscope is put into body plot mode so that it will be able to sweep a test signal using the signal generator between two extreme frequencies. So I'm testing between 10 Hz and 100 kHz today. It might be worth to point out that the test signal isn't just an AC signal, but it also has a DC component so that the power supply can actually work with the injected signal. Final thoughts, the output of the power supply is connected to an active load and an ammeter which is off screen. So if we run our measurement, so what we get is a very nice graph. So this is inverted to what you would normally find. It's expressed in minus decibels, so how much attenuation there is on the output. Normally you will find this with a positive value, but anyway, we see a very nice attenuation of around 70, 80 decibels up until about 1 kilohertz, after which it drops off. So the exact behavior will be dependent on the various capacitors placed in the circuit, but also on the power supply itself. So how well does the feedback loop react to external perturbations? Now, for this particular part, you do get this sort of graph in the datasheet, and while well, the datasheet and our measurement are not exactly the same, but to an extent, that is because of the different test conditions. 
So the datasheet uses one specific set of test conditions, whereas we have used a different set. As always, it's important to test the power supply under the specific use case conditions. And the datasheet information is there just for information purposes. Final thing to consider, which is most relevant when a proper low noise supply is needed, is the contribution from the control loop elements. Here, the main factors are the voltage reference, the error amplifier, and the feedback resistors. The major contributor here usually is the voltage reference. The older Zener based references were more noisy, but in most modern regulators, the reference is of band gap type, which is far better. Now, you do have the buried Zener technology, but usually that is more expensive. So the band gap sees the most widespread use. Anyway, for certain regulators, it is possible to improve this noise source by filtering just the reference by itself, as is the case for the LM723. So if we have a look in the datasheet of this particular part, we can see that it has a Zener based reference, which is not directly connected to the error amplifier. So the connection is done through external pins. And if we go a bit lower, we can see our typical application in which the reference is connected to one of the amplifier's inputs through some resistors and a filtration capacitor. Now, the exact effect of this capacitor is highlighted in the datasheet section regarding output noise. So, without any sort of capacitor, you're looking in the 86 microvolt RMS range, whereas with a 5 microfarad capacitor, this significantly drops down to 2.5 microvolts. So, for the specified bandwidth, with or without this capacitor, you should see a massive difference in output noise. Now, reference filtration is not always possible with other ICs, but when it is, it's important to take into consideration. Next, we have the error amplifier and the various internal circuits. There are multiple types of noise in action here, but to simplify, it's important to observe that any transistor has noise. You can build low noise transistors, but if the circuit is very complex, meaning that it's built from many, many transistors, the noise will add up. You might find that sometimes a simple regulator is lower noise than a more complex one, simply because it has fewer components which add to the overall noise. And finally, the feedback resistors have an associated thermal noise. This is temperature dependent, noise increases with temperature, but the big contribution here is the exact resistance value. So using lower value resistors, although will increase the current consumption of the supply, should help lower the overall noise, if this is the major contributor. Now, at this point, you're trying to measure very small levels of noise, which will not really be possible using your typical oscilloscope connection. So the oscilloscope's built-in noise will usually be comparable or significantly larger than the noise that you're trying to measure. To go around this problem, you'll need some sort of low noise amplifier. And fortunately for today's experiment, I already have such a circuit, which I designed and built in an older video. So I'll leave some links to that in the description if you're curious. So to perform this measurement, we'll get our test circuit supplied from a low noise supply, shield it as well as possible so that we're not measuring external noise, and then the output of the circuit will be connected to an active load, but also connected to our low noise amplifier, a circuit that is bandwidth limited to below 100 kilohertz, and that amplifies with a factor of a thousand, and then the output of this will be the thing that we're measuring with our oscilloscope. So let's set everything up. First off, our supply is off, but we can start by making a noise floor measurement. So if I turn on my low noise amplifier, we can see that the oscilloscope is measuring about 15 millivolts peak to peak, which is actually 15 microvolts peak to peak because of the times 1000 gain, and an RMS value of 1.7 milli, which is 1.7 micro. So, although the circuit isn't perfectly noise free, the noise that we're measuring is low enough so that we can proceed with our measurement. So now, when we turn on our power supply, the linear regulator is working, and we can clearly see that the noise measured by our setup has significantly increased. So this isn't noise coming from the amplifier, it's coming from the actual test circuit. And what we get is about 70 something microvolts peak to peak of noise, 
which amounts to about 8.4 microvolts of RMS noise. Now, is this value good or bad? Well, for this particular power supply, the datasheet gives us a typical value of 40 microvolts RMS. So with this measurement, we can say that the power supply is working very well and the noise level is nicely below the datasheet typical value. In the end, power supply output noise has multiple causes and reasons for being there. Starting with the power supply type, the environment around it, and finally the specific way in which the circuit is built. Now, noise can be reduced by adding various filters to the output of the circuit, but that is usually not a desired solution since it will affect the dynamic and static performance. If you need a low noise supply, it's best to start by minimizing the noise from the core of the circuit and choose an appropriate low noise IC to begin with. And with that said, hope you got some useful information out of this, leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching, be sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my videos and see you next time. Bye bye.